community. Sorry for that. And scientists to create the possibility for republics of care by engaging creatives with the social de determinants of health to challenge the dominant narratives of need, othering and belonging while creating new ritual for contemporary aging. Welcome, Mr. Dominic Campbell. How are you doing? <laughs> I'm doing good. That was a lovely introduction. Thank you so much. Thank you, John. Thank you, Theresia. Hello, Kunle. Uh, hello, everybody, wherever you're calling in from, Nigeria, South Africa, Germany. Uh, it's really lovely to be here. I uh, started this session last year, and I'm going to be with you twice. Today, we're going to talk about uh, leadership and creating uh, arts and health interventions, arts and health projects. And then in a few weeks time, we'll talk about designing those projects. So um, firstly, I want to say you are very, very welcome. I am delighted you were here, whether you have huge experience or you're just getting started. Um, you are very much the expert in being yourself. And that idea that, that everybody that we work with, every patient that we work with, every project that we do is made by people who are the expert at being themselves is very key, I think to what we'll talk about. So say hello in the chat if you can access it. When we do sessions like this, when I'm not using the slides, if you can put on your, your, your camera and show your lovely selves, that's always fantastic. If you can't, don't worry. If your internet is dodgy, if your electricity is sporadic, if uh, you are uh, hanging upside down in a car surrounded by children, no worries, don't worry about it. But if you can, when we do this session, when we do the sharing talking, would be fantastic. It's very nice to see people saying hello. Um, what else do I want to talk about? I want to say that um, I'm really interested in older people, as Theresa was saying, I'm really interested in uh, li li long lives being the sign of a really successful health and care system and also the sign of a successful society and where they interact is really uh, fascinating to me. But I'm also interested in how we create the systems that make that possible wherever we do that. So I'm talking to you from Dublin, Ireland. Uh, currently I know is in Lagos, Nigeria. There are people in uh, Alexandra and the places, the context that we work in are very, very different. But there are lots of great assets, including you in each of those places. So today we're going to talk about how we build from those assets, how we make fantastic, exceptional, rich arts and health projects that do amazing things for you, for the people that you work in, regardless of the places that you uh, that you work, work in, places that you work in. Um, there are a lot of slides, there are a lot of information and the reason for this is really simple. I wanted to give you tools that you can use wherever you work. So don't feel bewildered that you can't keep all of this in your head as we go. Don't be, don't feel that you, how do I capture all of this? How do I keep it? We will send you or give you access to these slides. And there are lots and lots and lots of lovely links that you can root through, that you can explore at your own time afterwards. So you will literally have a set of tools for making your own kind of projects. Um, now, what else do I want to say before we really get into this? Um, it's really in, today is really in three or four sections in how I think about it. And uh, the first of those sections is really about what makes an effective leader the qualities of an effective leader, how do we define those? The second section is really about exploring, swimming, uh, exploring what art-based interventions can be and how we can develop them and how we can lead them. And then the third bit is suggesting roles and tools and processes that you might use as you make your own art-based interventions. So the focus of this is giving you things that you can take and adapt and use in your own work and practice. So I'm gonna ask you 
uh, questions as we go. And I'm going to try and invite you to, uh, to, to tell me things I don't know. So let's start with some simple things. Um, can you describe either in the chat or raise up a hand and I'll try and come to you, um, the worst leader you know? What makes them the worst leader you know? What makes them terrible? So you might put a keyword into the chat. They're terrible because, or you might lift up your hand and I'll see if I can invite you to speak. Hey. Okay, so people are poor communicator. They're good, keep them coming in the chat. Uh, Heather Mustafa, would you like to speak? Would you like to explain the Definitely. worst? Good morning or good afternoon from Cairo, Egypt. Hi, yeah, thank you. Well, the worst leader uh, is the one who, what we call a, a one-man show. I've actually worked with a couple of those, uh, <laughs> that they know it all. They all, they are the only one who are allowed to speak and make decisions, do everything. It's a one-man show. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for speaking first. We all know some of those people, the one man show. Uma, I can see your hand. What would you like to add? Uma, while you're unmuting yourself, I'm going to add in some bits from the chat. Terrible listeners, authoritarian, neglecting team building. Yay. Inability to hold space for multiple views. Yep. Mm -hmm. Self centered doesn't understand the needs of people. Ignorant, has no compassion. Compassion's a really good one. Uh, ooh, they're coming fast. Can't trust their team in good and bad times. Laissez-faire, maybe. Judgment, yeah, yeah, yeah. We've got really clear ideas about what makes terrible leaders. Uh, Uma, just try unmuting yourself. Uma Dejnio, uh, let me just ask you to unmute. Maybe you can add in and let me see if there's anybody else with their hand up. It's great. There's 77 of you and one of me. So it takes me a minute. Okay. Sometimes that works. Um, okay. There's a lot of thoughts. Selfish. Fails to inform others of decisions being made. The chat's really good. Okay. Pause for a second. Let's just think about the other side of the spectrum, the other side of the cone. What makes a fantastic leader? Who is the best leader you can think of? Again, Jack. So this might be the best leader in your family. It might be the best leader in your work. It might be the most effective, any scale you want. What makes the best leader? Let's see what we have. Inclusiveness, humility, and empathetic. Yep. Selfless, good listener. Woo, woo, woo. We like these. Yeah. Principal roles enable and empower a team, teamwork, human resources, who listens, who understands. Uma can't unmute the mic. No worries. Glad you can chat, though. Uh, best leader knows the talents of each person, makes use of it to get the most beneficial teamwork. And change computer. Adaptability, great leadership though. Uh, good social skills, openness. Come on, let's see what else. Just a little bit more. Democratic, accepts criticism. Innovative team player, bottom top leadership skills. Yeah. Dedicated, passionate, selfless facilitator. Great, friendly, understanding, sense of humor. Sacrifices, great. Okay, just keep them coming. I'm going to share some slides. What I'm going to do is uh, pull out some ways of thinking about leadership. And uh, it's really evident from the chat and from the feedback that you've got some really good um, understanding and experience. And a lot of you thought about this a lot. So let's just do the next technical bit. Um, yeah, I do the sharing the screen. Yeah, it's good. It works. I do the make the screen big thing. Hopefully. Cool. Uh, I can jump through those slides. So these slides I borrowed 
from uh, the American Association of Nurse Assessment Coordination. Um, and they talk about five nursing leadership styles. So they're very much in the environment that some of you will be working in. They work with nurses, they work with formal healthcare system, and they say, okay, transformational leadership. These are, uh, these are leaders whose focus is to encourage, to motivate employees to take ownership for their own roles and perform beyond the expectation. And then they say, mm, there's some really good positives. They raise morale, motivation. They're really good at conflict resolution. But they also say there's some negatives. They're not so good for brand new organizations. So uh, let's think about that in a minute. Okay, so, so they're really good at giving people, you know, you, you, you do that particular role, you're the person in charge of triage, you take it on, you manage it, you can develop it, I can check in with you occasionally, I can inspire you, keep you motivated. But if I was setting up a triage unit, maybe that's not the best way of working because maybe at the very beginning of a new project or a new organization initiative, I just need to be really bossy. I need to say, this is the role. These are the three things I need to just do those things. Start there, let's get it moving. So, okay, so there's some pros and cons. Second one is democratic. Somebody said in the chat, they said democratic leaders, they welcome and encourage input and communication from a team when making decisions. The positive is that they create a culture that promotes input from an entire team. Yep. The cons, not so good in emergencies where a rapid response is required. So in the chat, why might it be uh, that a democratic approach is not so good in an emergency situation? Any ideas? Why might a democratic approach not be so good in a crisis? Adiemi, do you want to unmute and explain? Hello, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, perfect. Yeah, this is Adiemi from Nigeria. Good afternoon. Hi. Yeah, well, I think the democratic process is a really long process in the sense that um, it requires voting all the participants and members contributing their ideas. And that is a very long process. Rather than when the idea just goes to one person and then there's a strict verdict about what needs to be done. That's much more faster. Perfect, perfect, perfect. Anybody want to add something onto that? Uh, onto what Emily said? Any, anything to add to that? Democratic processes take time. Yeah, no, same sort of thing in the chat. Uh, somebody also in the chat said, will we get the slides afterwards? You will get the slides afterwards and all the links. Victor Duru, what would you want to add? Unmute yourself, hello. Okay, hello. Hi. Yeah, um, I feel that democratic leadership, when it comes to that kind of leadership, when people tend to make their opinions, there might be a bit of an argument of who is right and who is wrong. So there, it, it causes more conflict than it resolves. So I believe that democratic leadership, it's not good in a um, conflict um, um, situation because it can tend to prolong the conflict rather than solve the problem. Yeah, brilliant, brilliant. So great, really good answers. It takes time, you're seeking consensus. There's a process to go to. While you're doing that, the crisis is getting bigger. So, so maybe an emergency situation is not so good. So I'll just recap, we talked about transformational, we talked about democratic. They said there are five that they use uh, in the nursing organization in America. So laissez-faire, somebody said laissez-faire in the, in the chat when we were asking for approaches. So laissez-faire, what does it mean? It means hands off. It means, yeah, you come, you got the job, you do your thing, that's fine. I, I'm gonna go and do whatever it is I need to look after that I think is important. So I'm gonna do the budgets or I'm, I'm gonna, uh, I don't know, mend the electrics or I'm gonna go do my thing and you go do your thing. So that's not bad if you've got a highly effective team, if people are been working together for a long time. So with some of the teams I work with, I don't need to worry about 
my friend Beatrice looking after her part of it. I don't need to look here, look after Cuddly on working on the parts of projects that I work on with him. People are really good at what they do. So cons though, in the, in the American system, they say the laissez-faire thing is not so good uh, in the healthcare industry, this is America, remember, where there's a constant change of team. So there's always people coming out and coming in and going out. Um, why else laissez-faire might be good, might not be good. Any thoughts? Hands up or in the chat? Why is a kind of hands-off approach? Was it good? Why might it, might it not work? Eki. Unmute and say hello. Yeah. Hello, Hi. everyone. I'm just going to try and put my video on. Um, oh, well, you can't. You can barely see me. But yeah, yeah um, I'll give you an example. Um, by the way, I'm in the UK, currently in Scotland. And um, basically, an example being that my daughter um, just graduated and she started a job, her very first job. And um, it is in the healthcare sector, but she's basically managing a recruitment agency. Being that she's never actually done anything like this before, and it's her first role, I would like to think that her um, employers are using this laissez-faire laissez um, approach. It leaves her very confused. It leaves her, you know, doing what she thinks is the right thing. And then, Paul, you know, after having a discussion with them, they want something completely different. So I think um, maybe like it says um, on the slide that um, where you have professionals and you have people who are already capable of doing this work and they've got a track record, it may be an okay situation, but definitely not when you've got new people coming in who have not got the experience or do not even know the sector. So, that's that's what I think. Right. That's a fantastic example. And if you think about it, if everybody thinks about it for themselves, you really don't want to start working in a new job, in a new role for someone who's like, yeah, it's okay, you can go do your thing when you don't know your way around. I, I thank you for bringing the, the story about your daughter. It's such a good example. When I start a new role in a new place, I need someone to give me some direction. I need to know the landscape I'm working in. So really important that uh, you think about the pros and also the cons of each of those leadership styles. Let's take, uh, where are we at? Number five, I think. Authoritarian, extremely hands-on. Interesting that I did it in a very manly voice. Uh, includes a great deal of decision-making, makes decisions without inputs from their team. In the chat, lots of people talked about this. They said, mm, yeah, no, no, no. We can see a lot of cons in that. There's lots of, uh, we can see all the negatives. We, we see that it doesn't promote trust or communication wants to seem it stopped collaborative decision-making. Not many people talked about the pros. Sometimes that clear leadership is, is really important. Eki's example of, you know, for her daughter to start a new, a new role for someone to say, I want you to do this very clearly uh, would be really useful. So the pros about, the authoritarian type approach um, are that they're effective at making quick decisions. They serve a team well in emergencies. Uh, just, just for a challenge, because it's easy, I think, to find the, the negatives about the authoritarian ones. Where else or how else, when else might that, that hands-on decision be really useful? Any thoughts? Uh, let me move my screen around so I can have a quick look. Any thoughts? Where might a really clear Yeah, Geraldine saying allows the yeah. Where there's confusion and infighting, Femi, yeah, nice one. When a team isn't actually being effective and actually it's spending so much time having fuss and fighting with each other that you're not getting anywhere. That's a good example. It's a good idea. Any other? What else? 
We'll whiz through all the little squares and see if there's hands up that I'm missing. Military, it's a very military way of thinking, you know, secure the boundaries, uh, make sure there's fresh water. So in a crisis during war, maybe, yeah, yeah. And you can see during a, a, a you could take uh, the idea of during a war and you could think about that as during a, a medical emergency. The team's inefficient, says Budmuth, and shows tendencies for incapabilities. Yep, they're pretty good. Okay. So, sports. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't want a laissez-faire football team. Yeah, you're going to be in goal? No, no. You're going to be attacking? I don't. I want people to be really clear. I want clear leadership. Um, so the point of these five is to show that depending on the context and depending on the, the process, different leadership styles are really uh, useful. Victor saying, when there's a deadline to meet and teammates are not putting an effort, yeah. Yeah, it's often, often the change of leadership style is to do with time, it's to do with the context, it's to do with what the task is that we're trying to develop. Are we trying to be really expansive and have lots of new ideas and include lots of different opinion? Are we trying to uh, get something over the line? Um, here's another one. Uh, and this is the final one of these, service. Um, so a, a service-based leader is someone who motivates others by building relationships and developing the skills of individual team members they're they're in essence they are in service to their teams great for multiple disciplinary and diverse teams seeks to meet the needs of all the team members i really like this as a way but what i also recognize is that um it's got it's got limited uh it's limited by context so sometimes this is quite a slow form of leadership sometimes uh the individuals who take this approach are, are more concerned with the individual trees than the, than the forest. So poor, poor performing teams may continue to suffer. And it's not recommended when top-down decisions must be made. So for example, um, it might be a challenge if a project isn't working and you need to move uh, a team from one way of working into a completely different one. Uh, or from one location to another one. So those are all the way that the, the National Association of Nurses in the US, they, they think about the five ways. There's another way though, of thinking about leadership skills. And it's less from function than by emotion. And um, a way of summarizing this really quickly is to think about emotional leadership as Empathic, which somebody mentioned in the chat, generous or create courageous. And I think the way of the way of starting to think about these is by by looking for how you can find them. So I think empathic is perhaps the easiest one. Um, an empathic leader is someone who has great social skills. They're really uh, self-aware. They are self-regulated. So what do we mean by self-regulated? Well, if you think about the, the, uh, the leader as servant, one of the challenges with the leader as servant is that they can be quite bad at managing time. They can spend all of their time thinking about how they support their team and different team challenges and maybe the emotional life of their team members and uh, you know somebody in their team might have had a crisis lately and and it becomes very difficult as an individual to go up and down that that orchestra of emotions and so the self-regulation is important in an empathic approach to leadership because it's about how you set your own boundaries and so you can relate to others you can look for what motivates people, but you're doing it within a framework that makes you more effective and efficient. Um, let me try a second one, and then we might talk about these a little bit. Generous. So this, these little squares are uh, almost like a, a, a bingo card 
for identifying a generous leader. Does the leader have patience? Are they trustworthy? Are they the kind of leader who doesn't hold grudges? You maybe have a debate because everybody has a debate with people that they work with at some point, but then they forget about it or they, they mark the end of that and they move on. Uh, do they keep their batteries charged? Are they, do they come into a, a project or a day's work energized? So they haven't um, made themselves tired because they forgot to look after themselves and, and keep themselves in a place where they can afford to be generous. Um, do they, do they, do they, do they think about the environment in which people are working, uh, which might be the physical environment? How long does it take people to get to work? Are they going to arrive tired? So this is a useful little tick list. And like I say, you get the slides to think about what makes a generous leader. And then the third one, I think, is courageous. And again, this is a, a sort of tick list for thinking about, are you a courageous leader? What might, when you might be a courageous leader? So um, which one will we start with? I think courageous leaders, I think the ability to confront uncomfortable truths head on is a really good place to start. So let me think of an example. Um, it might be that the organization that you work with or for isn't resolving the problem that it set out to do. And how you walk through that uncomfortable truth is a really strong sign, I think, of what kind of leadership you bring, what kind of person you are. Do you walk around uh, like a teenager going, <laughs> do you just have rows all the time? Do you try and find a way of working with everybody else to make the best possible outcome you can? Do you, but what keeps you courageous regardless of how you work is that you don't let that uncomfortable truth go away. You keep coming, to, you keep finding ways of coming back to it. And to do that is about self-discipline. It's about establishing higher standards for yourself. I'm not okay with just doing what we're doing if it's not working. So it's about motivating yourself from within. No one is going to thank you for telling them that what they're trying to do isn't quite working in whatever way that you do it. However, whether you do it nicely, whether you can be charming, whether you have to be a bit confrontational. So the motivating yourself from within is really important. And I think part of that motivating yourself from within is about your own vulnerability. There is an extraordinary thing that happens in some forms of leadership, which are appropriate at some point, where you say, I don't know. I, I'm not sure this works really. I, I think this might be the right thing to do, but I'm not sure. I need help. Please, would you help me to solve this problem? And that vulnerability quite often is an extraordinarily rich place from which to start an arts and health project, for instance, or to start a new initiative to manifest your vision. So finally, I suppose the last income tip list for, cour for courageous leadership is about giving yourself permission to claim courage. Um, it's about saying, if not me, who? If not now, when? It's about saying, I might not be the perfect leader, but right now I'm good enough. I'm a good enough leader to do this thing that I think is important, that will make change. Um, it's about allowing yourself. You are the expert in being yourself. You are the right person at this time to try whatever it is you're about to start. So uh, how do we apply that to leading a creative process, an arts and health project? Well, one way is to sort of step back from the problems a little bit, to sit outside, to get onto the balcony, as some people say, and look at what the real root of the problem is. What is the challenge? To sit really far back and say, 
Uh, let me think. I had a friend um, who had a child come into their, their, their little health clinic and the child's fingers were bleeding. And they, they mended the fingers, they bandaged them together. And then they said, so how did this happen? And the child went, oh, well, I put my hand in my pocket and they brought them out again and they'd cut another two or three fingers because they had a pocket full of glass. So it's a really simple example of, you know, the, the problem isn't necessarily, you can fix this problem, the bleeding fingers, but you kind of need to look at what caused it. So you identify the challenge, you go back down uh, the root, down the branches of the tree to the roots to see what it is that's, that's causing the problem. Um, regulate the stress is about self-managing, disciplined attention. We sort of talked about giving work back to employees. We've sort of talked about in, in building teams, protecting voices from below. So protecting voices from below is uh, really about checks and balances. So I'm going to ask you, why is it important to protect voices from below? Why might it be important to protect voices from below? when you're leading an arts and health project or a creative process. Give me some thoughts, give me some ideas. Chat or what about hand? Uma. Okay, hi. hi. Uh, I'm Costa Rica and I'm from Venezuela. Well, um, protecting voices from below helps also protect, if we think of, uh, for example, a context of public policy, arts in public policy or cultural policies. This would protect also minorities' thoughts. And, and that's very, very important for democracy and also for a creative process. Thank you. Fantastic example. Thank you very much. I'm glad you got your computer working as well. It's very yep. nice to hear you. <laughs> hey, top leadership. Sort out the problem you have first, then you can contribute. Yeah, great example. Um, so Eki said, I don't quite understand the term voices from below. So, so um, let's think about it as uh, the decision-making table, the room where the decisions are made. So who gets to be in that room? Whose voices get heard? How do we hear them? Uh, how do they inform, as Uma was saying, the policy that comes from that consultation process? Um, it might be... I think the most important voice is quite often the voice of the patient. How do we hear the voice of the patient? Um, in, a, in a medicalized program where quite often we're, we're dealing with issues of, of, of or the challenges often phrased, the problems are often phrased as biological problem, problems, then, then remembering that we're not just dealing with biology, we're dealing with a person and we're dealing with a person in a relationship uh, is a uh, is, is critical and key and the voice that we often forget or people can often forget or the systems of care can often forget is the voice of the patient so uh, two good reasons the third reason I think is that we can be wrong um, we can be um, we can be very carried away by our own brilliant creativity and how fantastic we are at what we're doing and we just forget to listen so it's important to protect uh, voices from below who might be in your team, who might be the, the shy team member, the person that they don't, you know, they never put up their hand, or they're not, um, it's, it's, it's culturally not what happens in their, in their country, in their context, or in their workplace. To speak out is not normal in many, 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 many workplaces. Uh, and if you're shy, um, like I can be, or you're sometimes shy, then uh, having a leader who is sufficiently attuned and sensitive to make space for all the voices in their team, or all the patients that they're working with, or even the people that don't get to become patients because they just don't connect with whatever the system of care is. Those things are really important. So let me try and summarize this and then I'm gonna ask you something else. Um, so leadership in arts and health project is 
it is a process. Different types of leaderships really useful at different times. And one of the things that you might need to ask yourself is which one when. The other thing is that as, as people, you're going to be really fantastic at some things. And if you're anything like me, there'll be things that you're not so hot at, not so good at. So it's really important that you remember to analyze yourself, to give yourself time to think about what you are strong at and what you need to work at, and then to think about how you can work at it. Um, okay, I'm gonna pause for a second there, I think. Let me just check the next slide. But I am where I think I am, yeah. Um, I'm gonna stop sharing the screen yep okay that's good i can see lovely people hey lots of you um thoughts and questions on on leadership and leadership being not a fixed thing but a process a thing that's different at different times any observations any what are you thinking about on your sunday mornings afternoons and evenings Okay, just wondering, I'm just wondering, April asked me, would I, what's the question again? Uh, having listened to me talk for about 20 minutes, 30 minutes about leadership, I'm wondering, do you have any questions, any thoughts, anything where you're going, what did he mean by, um, just if you've got any, anything that's worth bringing into the conversation now, uh, then, then here's a chance to do so. Uh, Adi Emi, I saw your hand first. Say say hi. What's your question? What's your what's your thought? Okay, uh, Adi Emi here from Nigeria. Uh, I just feel like um one of the most um important just a comment on what I've heard so far. Um, that um uh, the form of leadership that I think it's quite important the most is um servant leadership, in the sense that um what really makes an organization is the um, quality of people that they produce and uh, what these people are capable of doing outside the organizations and on their own. So when you focus on just serving on them, serving them, those people within your team and ensuring that each one of them grow up personally and they become better individuals, you, you would not just be making impact out there, but then you'll be making impact on those people that work on you, with you and uh, the, the, the effect, you'll be even able to communicate your vision better in that way, you'll be able to communicate the kind of goal that you want to that you want to give out to people out there. And this one, you this one when you see that people that are, they are very, very committed to what you are doing is because they've come to understand who you are, what you want to do, and where you're going. So I believe that this is something that that brings about a long lasting, um, long lasting effect on the society when we have something like a servant leadership. Yeah. Oh, fantastic, great contribution. There's, um, I'm also looking at the chat at the same time. So uh, excuse me while I multitask. Um, Nanya said something interesting, which I think relates. She said, I've identified what kind of leader I am and what I need to work at. Yeah. Um, Diana Eagle said, for me, it's been hard to know what style of management when talking with my management helpful to allow a space for this. And I think all three, are really important. You're never a leader on your own. There's that great thing that, you know, leaders need followers. So it's always contextual. It's always in relationship. Uh, Uma, then April, then Victor, you might just uh, introduce yourself, say what you want and pass on to the next person. And I'll, I'll comment if you want a response. Uma first, then April, then Victor. Uh, hi there. Um, yeah, I wanted to say just relating um, the experience of leadership in my country, my own country, more politically speaking, more than arts, but it's actually extended to every to every corner of the country that I'm not so sure that we need auto autocratic um, leadership, because autocratic leadership in my country has led to a complete breakdown and crisis 
politically speaking, economically and um, morally, <laughs> mainly. Um, so, um, or I wouldn't work, uh, use that word. I don't know why it's scary <laughs> somehow. Thank you. Thank you, April. Thank you, Uma. April, go on, unmute and unmute. Um, yes, yeah, so I think I have questions regarding, I'm April and I'm in the US, and um, I often think about more community-oriented principles um, of life that seems as though they would just transfer more, transfer more easily um, within addressing some of the issues and leadership um, in a lot of different sectors that I've experienced here, and wanted to know if you had any input around um, how to create space or set up opportunities for people to truly like understand or digest the importance of uh, community principles when it comes to amplifying um, how impactful you know leadership can be. Fantastic. I'm delighted that you brought that up and brought that in. And as we work through the rest of this, I think a lot of what you're uh, alluding to, thinking about, will come in and um, yeah, how do you, how do you, how do you create space? How do you think about what the impact of leadership is, if I'm right? Yeah. How do you nod if I'm kind of right or add? Oh, mute. April, unmute and just say what you were just April, can you raise your hand so I can mute you? Okay, sorry. Um, from community perspectives and, and community principles and like those, those seven principles that individuals um, talk about from the bottom up um, and why, why that is important in understanding ourselves and how we relate to one another. Um, and while I'm just on here, I'm also thinking about the impact of like silence, because I know I'm an art therapist. As an art therapist, we really rely on the communication of silence. And so I'm wondering even that nonverbal processing of working with one another just by understanding um, body language and when people start to tense up and when people start to shift. Um, to limit some of that verbal discourse. Thank you. They are beautiful additions and then expansive contributions to the conversation. Um, because inevitably with this medium, there's lots of words and lots of talk. But um, in the environments that people work in, particularly if you're working in a person-centered process then, or you're working with people who are less verbal um, or non-verbal, then you've got lots of different tools to use. But also, I think the other thing that April brings in, which I think is incredibly important, is uh, the patterns and shapes that we have, the frameworks that we have in mind when we start projects. So whether they're top-down or bottom-up, for instance, or why can't they be circular? where those simply those framings does it always have to be talk start to get us to work in a particular way there was a question in the chat which was kent's which i think we're going to get into who leads during creative processes that is such a good question who leads during a creative process uh somebody else says Chukwamika says, is it possible to possess all five types of leadership approach? Absolutely. Absolutely. Different types of approach, different times. Victor, you've been waiting patiently. Please, what would you like to bring in? What would you like to add? You need to unmute. So Victor, do, yeah. Yeah, I'm Victor from Nigeria. Um, based on the based on the um, definition, I, I believe that um, the laser fair leadership um, works will work better in organizations that retain interns. In organizations that retain interns, because the interns being there for three months, six months, would have gotten an idea of what to do and how to do it. So it's easy when they are retained, 
They don't need to be monitored to know what to do and when to do it. So I believe organizations that retain interns can easily inculcate the, um, um, the laser fair leadership. And also secondly, um, the, the, about the voices, protecting the voices um, from below. I believe that it's so important because even as individuals, we also have voices from below in our set within us. Because, uh, um, for example, every great, I usually say every great invention was once a stupid idea. And, and when those ideas pop up, you're like, this cannot be possible because there was like, uh, let's say, imagine a flying car or a car that drives itself. It's once a stupid idea because nobody believed that something like that could be possible. So, so voices from below could be the great, uh, um, uh, the brilliant idea that we don't usually know. Thank you. Fantastic. And you've started to open up all sorts of interesting spaces. You started to think about uh, how do we innovate? There is no, I firmly believe there is no such thing as a stupid idea. Absolutely believe that. There's no such thing as a stupid question. Um, there, is, there is a question that's right for you. There are different, better and worse ways of answering those questions. But actually, sometimes the, what feels like a ridiculous question is the way of looking at something through a different viewpoint. It's the beginning of the creative process. And we're all about talking about leadership in creative process. We're talking about creativity for health. There are two or three people that I want to get around to. Uh, Oluwatim Melin, Ahmed, sorry. Uh, you have your hand up for a while. And then uh, Eki, and then I'm going to move to the next bit. Please. Ahmed, please. Okay, and um, thank you very much. Um, I think from experience doing um, switching between leadership, I, I think the first thing for someone to be, once someone becomes a leader, is to be a servant leader. So you identify those people that are within your team that can help you to build up the team much, much more better. Then you, that's when you become much more democratic. You listen to their ideas, you hear more of their thoughts, before you become motivational, you motivate them to do something, um, to do something uh, within their self, to believe more of, more of them. That means once you are able to motivate your team, that means they go through a stage becoming, um, that is the transformational uh, leadership. That means you are able to transform each and every of your member to become much more independent in their own self which will result into the Vassel, uh, Vassel, um leadership, which you can allow, you have much more confidence across time due to the fact that you have experience on building each and every one of them to this point at which they are independent on themselves. So in, on the authoritative leadership, I believe that most times, once you have trust in, trust in your system and you know the each and every one's um, most thoughts, because most times when you are team building, you are able to bond and know each and everyone, everyone's um, weak points and also their strong points. That's when you can be able to decide without um, needing to consult for them across time. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you, everybody. One last, uh, one last person. Somebody else had their hand up. Okuma. Genevende. Yeah. Your contribution, please. Nope. Okay, I can't hear you. Maybe, maybe you'd add into the chat, and I'll keep keep moving along. So, uh, in the chat, I can see lots of people saying different types of leadership in different situations. Uh, think about that emotional. Think about the style. Great. How do we think about that in terms of a, a creative, uh, an arts and health? arts in health projects and arts in health intervention. So, um, and this is where it might all go horribly wrong. Um, can you, in, your, in the chat, uh, list, uh, do, 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 do. actually no, I'll do it another way around. I'm gonna invite you to talk about um, 
arts and health projects, arts and health projects that you would think are fantastic. I'm going to take maybe two or three examples, and then I'm going to move on to some other versions just because I want to keep, uh, I have to keep an eye on time. So anybody really want to talk about an amazing project that they're, they're familiar with or that inspires them or that they're, they're keen on? Let's try and hear some voices that we haven't, that haven't had a chance to speak yet. Ria, please. Hi, Dominic, how are you doing this morning? Afternoon, morning, wherever you are, I think. Um, right, um, I am Ria, I'm from South Africa. Um, and basically in 2016, we did a project here in South Africa. It was basically like a series of projects. Um, where we invited visual artists to submit specifically artworks that had some relation to the HIV and AIDS crisis in South Africa, specifically because it's such a big deal in South Africa still. Um, and the aim was we partnered with the Australian Council for the Arts and the Australian High Commission and Dot Australia, and we had um, enough money that we gave out free condoms and lubes, but the condoms were the artworks. So the artworks were basically on the packaging. Um, and then they had like a little info pack um, on um, PrEP, because PrEP is something that's not widely known in South Africa, which is sad. Um, but we also did um, have information about where people can use the resources that are already available in their communities in order for them to like get prep if they needed to get prep or um, such and such. And finally, after that series of like handing out condoms and um, having like this creative base with visual artists, we ended with a art exhibition with um, one of South Africa's best um, trans artists, who's Robert Hamblin. And he did a series with sex workers um, on the HIV and AIDS crisis, specifically around sex work in South Africa. And we had an art and exhibition and a sex talk, I guess is what you would call it. Um, and everybody use their fingerprints um, and create an, a beautiful huge artwork using their fingerprints and paint um, on the day um, just so that we could have like some consolidation and that's one of the artworks that have traveled um, very far um, that we've come out with um, as one of our projects yes so that's a project that I'm very proud of as a Thank program you. manager and fantastic and I love to hear projects that people are proud of like that, that you're really inspired by work that you've been involved in. It's what motivates us, I think. Uh, let's, anybody else, anybody else got a project that they're bursting to tell us about? Let's see. Anybody who hasn't spoken just yet? Uh, Ria, Gabby is saying, do you have a link? Yeah, if you have projects that have some web presence or a report, then put them in the chats. One of the most amazing things about this fellowship is the opportunity to learn from each other. Um, I, there's only one of me, there are I'm 93 of you at the moment. So you're like a fantastic library of really great work. And all work is great in context. Okay, can't see anybody. Uh, I think Ahmed, I think your hand was up from before. Okay, so I'm gonna jump on to talking about projects. Let me just do the share screen. Send image, find slide. Okay, uh, make it bigger so you can see. So, so one of the reasons for asking uh, about art-based interventions is because I think quite often um, people can get very fixed in what they think an art-based intervention is. And what I want to do is give you some tools for thinking about them in a broader sense. So what are the best ones? Uh, what makes them great? Um, this is from Tom Smith. Uh, so this is now, I think, a bit dated, but it's useful. He uh, was a UK 
or is a UK-based academic, he was thinking about what do these projects do? And he, he made a kite, he made a quadrant. So he said the, the quadrants are really, um, they're thinking about impact. They're thinking about, is, is this arts and health project a more of an art project or more of a health service project? Is it more about an individual, the impact on an individual? Is it more about the impact on a social group? So is it about creativity and well-being? Are there projects that emphasize creativity as a route to well-being, um, where, where art is a potential therapy? Is it about somewhere between individual and the health service? So are we, is the art project supporting the individual uh, health journey or the health service to access involve uh, the individual? Um, and it's built on the belief that, that um, you can communicate with, with broad, broad groups as a whole, or is a, is a, is a project really about, about engaging groups? It's about health promotion, for instance, is a really good example of projects that fit there. So, so as you're thinking about projects and, and fantastic projects that you're aware of, or as you're thinking about developing your own, you might think about where they fit in this quadrant, or you might think about uh, something Connie and I were involved in developing for the Global Brain Health Institute, which we've nicknamed the Four Pockets Framework. And we talked about uh, creativity and connection, arts creativity and research, arts creativity and promotion, arts creativity and equity. So we summarise those as projects that engage, projects that explore, projects that advocate and projects that transform. And just for the sake of the next 50 minutes or so, I'm going to use those as, as, a, as a framework for talking about different types of projects, because I'm really aware when I talk to a group of 97 people or whatever's on the call at the moment, people have very different understanding and very different uh, contextual frameworks. So uh, projects that engage, these are often focused on, on individual folk, people and groups. They're often about uh, the role of creativity as a medium through which people can connect, a conduit for connection of empathy. So I am at the moment doing some work with the Irish Hospice Foundation, uh, a national program for palliative care. And one of the attractions of arts for that organization is that art is a common third. So their ambition is to encourage people to have more conversations about end of life, death, dying, grief, and bereavement. And they recognize that in this culture, that's quite difficult for many, many people. But what's easier is for people to talk about the film that they've seen in which a character died or had a, had a terminal diagnosis. And so the common third, the art, is the thing through which we can talk to each other about that thing that's difficult. Um, engaged projects, I think, are often about the the self in change. So I work an awful lot with older people. At some point in the journey into older age, your physicality changes, your uh, abilities change, your relationships change. And engagement projects are quite often about helping people to navigate the changes that they go through for themselves. Things like the social model of disability are really useful tools to think about. So uh, the social model of disability in a very quick summary is that uh, uh, we compound, we make more complicated um, challenge that everybody has to the extent that some people are made disabled by the structures that we put in place in, in society. So those structures might be transport system, healthcare system, uh, but they might also be beliefs. Um, other other examples of engage are about uh, they're about establishing trust in community, um, and a, a key question for those projects is: Are they made for people? Are they made with people, or are they everywhere? So let me explain. Let me give you an example for that. So um, yeah, arts and music projects. I'm sorry, arts and health projects that are music in hospitals. So 
is the project trying to improve the quality and culture of the healthcare centre by putting music everywhere? Or is it trying to put music in that place that is made specifically for a particular individual or a particular therapeutic output? Or is it trying to make music with people for the purposes of expression or ownership or uh, be recognizing that you have an identity that isn't just being a patient? Let me try and give you some examples. Magda, who was here, I think, last week or two weeks ago, lots of her projects are about engaged work. They're about fun. Their they're secret weapon is joy. They're encouraging movement and dance and connection and community. They're incredibly good at uh, reducing mental health impacts, stressing positivity, uh, encouraging behavioural change because you're working within a group of people where the cultural normal can uh, be positive. Um, Celia Pym, who is a, uh, a, an artist who makes things by mending. Um, and so she makes visual arts projects that are about uh, fixing, sewing together uh, jumpers or, or, or bags. Um, this is uh, a project or to remind me about a project that she did with trainee surgeons. And so obviously a trainee surgeon, their job is to sew people back together, to fix people. And there are some people that you can't fix just as there are some jumpers, some clothing that you can no longer mend. And so she was an artist in residence who invited the trainee surgeons to bring in items of clothing that, that were important to them. And she fixed them, mended them, or started a conversation through the work that she did, which was about how do you fix, how do you mend, and how do you decide, how do you reach the point, what happens when you have to let go? Um, for you, I'm going to jump just because I'm watching the clock. Um, actually, no, I'm not. Actually, for you, it's important. So um, this is work from uh, West Coast of America. Um, this particular set of slides are to remind me about work that started, particularly during the pandemic, that is online, that are about making social connection, not because it's people gathered in a room, but because it's people isolated in rooms that that connecting is incredibly valuable. And uh, there's a link in the, in the slides at the end where you can look at what they've been doing to explore that, um, that arena. So engage, explore. Explore is about um, arts and health projects, which are really asking, I think, new questions. They're going from binaries to spectrum. So they're saying, we used to talk about science and arts, and actually, or we used to talk about research by people and research for people, but actually that's a spectrum. There's a research that is by and with and for people. There are uh, arts and science, science and arts projects that are really intertwined. And I think this area is really making uh, new tools. It's making new ways of making knowledge. So visual recording, verbatim theater, giving cameras to people who are uh, patients, um, spending a lot of time thinking about the, the sort of engagement that uh, April was talking about. How do you create space and opportunity for interaction between people where knowledge is generated by that group, which isn't necessarily the knowledge that you as a leader recognize. It's knowledge that emerges. It has emergent potential. Not one that I have easy examples from. So I'm going to move on to the fourth one, which is about advocacy. And Raya, in a way, talked about these. These are, these are arts and health projects that are about messaging. So the easy version of this is um, public health programs. Stop smoking, wash your hands, uh, drink clean water, eat five vegetables a day. They are communicating uh, understanding of what makes health. Um, I mentioned that the Antonio Damasio, Antonio and Hannah Damasio, who are uh, uh, neuroscientists, really neurobehavioralists, I suppose, 
And they say that we are feeling machines that think, not thinking machines that feel. We make, as people, emotional decisions. And so the emotional communication of what we scientifically know, use a condom, is really important. And it's part of this work. And sometimes that looks like advertising. Sometimes it looks like something much more evolved, something much more subtle, maybe. Um, and what they often have is they have depth and reach and profile and scale. So they can reach large numbers of, of people and audiences. We saw these at the start of the pandemic everywhere. Uh, the arts in service for health message, med, messaging. Um, there are lots of online projects, two that I'm familiar with, uh, Citizen Brain or My Brain Robbie, which are about encouraging people to think about brain health. And then the fourth one is about transformation. So the fourth framework for thinking about the kind of projects that you're going to be creating. Uh, so engage, explore, advocate, and transform. Transform, I think, starts from thinking about who is responsible for health and how is health made? How do we, how do we make health? And when you start to think about that, then I think this happens. So you think, well, I can change the culture of a care setting or I can, I can make it look more beautiful. I can uh, make a mural on the wall. I can bring music in. But if that care setting is an environment that negatively impacts health, then it's like an oasis in a really turbulent sea. If the environment isn't necessarily the physical environment, but the community, what if the community is in opposition to the needs of care? Then no matter how much I change that little oasis, how much I make it a perfect space, people will continue to be sick. What if the society causes sickness? And I think when you start to think, when you sit back on the balcony far enough, as you're thinking about the projects that you do, to, to, uh, to go through that whole spectrum, then, there's a great, uh, that's where the transformative projects are starting to emerge from. I see there's lots of questions in the chat. I'll come to those in a second. So for me, transform is about joining all the parts together, the, the research part, the exploration, the engagement part, the connection with people, the, um, the advocacy part, the telling the story, making the messaging. Uh, so one example is the public health services in Philadelphia who do this really fantastic project about murals all around the city of Philadelphia. I've been doing it collaboratively for a long time. Uh, started from the health service perspective because they said, we have this health service, lots of people don't trust it, they don't use it. People don't go into the buildings because they're afraid of those buildings. They see people in you know, the suits with the ties and that's not for them. And so we need to go out into the public domain. And what they realized was if they, they went away from the health centers, I suppose, into the community at large. They could engage and connect with people in different ways. But what they didn't realize that as they went about that, they were also making the neighborhoods in which people live more beautiful. And just the making of beautiful neighborhoods affected the environment in which people were living. And telling that story, using the tools of, of, of joy and, and community and engagement had its own benefit had its own uh, great success. And so these are people I think that are good examples of, of transformers. They sound like Marvel Universe superheroes. Uh, Hope Zida, who runs the Ubuntu Festival in Rwanda, whose festival began because she said, aid agencies sent people to Rwanda after the genocide um, who encouraged a form of therapy that was to sit in rooms with candles and, and hear stories. Whereas what we needed to do was gather in stadiums. We needed to make celebration and identify life. Theaster Gate, the man with the timber, is an artist who almost by accident and then by evolution has begun to regenerate or change or improve from the assets of his community, the community in which he lives. And I think the from the assets of community is the key bit to, to his work. People own, are engaged, uh, are part of, uh, see themselves in the long lineage of the work that he makes, 
and the impact on on health on mental health on belonging um is is critical um i um who else would i touch in this uh agent poe can lay um the interesting there's a list of these in the the presentations at the end but what's important about these is, as leaders for transformation is that they they work across different types of information education understanding and awareness they are knitting together um different skills they are addressing these questions who is this for what is it that we're trying to do when should it happen why should it happen why should it happen how should it happen um, which leads us to the next bit. I can see lots of questions, so I'm going to stop the share. I'm going to go to the chat. And I'm going to see if I can respond to something in the chat. Adventures, I love that. Um, bear with me. Just bear with me. Uh, Ruth says, I think it's crucial for community-based art to bring about internal resilience, help people engage with the resources around them. Yeah. It's like a puzzle. Yeah, we need to collect parts together to see the whole picture. It's exactly what I'm saying. Uh, and then, uh, when I talk about the transformative arts and health projects, it's not just necessarily about one piece of puzzle. It's about trying to get far enough away from a particular issue to see all the things that make it happen and then going deep enough to find what the, the, the point of pressure is, the leverage is, the, what particular thing can you do? uh okay nothing specific i think so i'm gonna go on to uh the how i think so i wanted to give you that those frameworks the full pockets way of thinking um the the quadrants way of thinking about uh arts and health projects and then some examples so that as you start to develop or continue to develop your own work um, I think there's a useful tools for becoming clear about what it is you're trying to do and how you go about it. Okay, we are quarter past three, I think another 20 minutes. Um, and then that would be enough of me talking and I can spend lots of time listening to you, which is much more interesting. Um, just before I dive into the next section, though, anything that anybody wants to bring um, at this point anything that anybody's thinking about do we need a bit of a stretch maybe have i talked you into silence that's always the worry with a two-hour session on zoom huh? at some point i see people doing this sliding out camera shot uh okay just give your hands a shake let's do this it's probably as much for me as for anybody else yeah Okay, put one hand up. Put one hand down. Put the other hand up. One hand down. Give your shoulders a good shake. Yay. Okay, if you are on a chair, stand up. I won't because I'll disappear out of sight. If you stretch out your legs, if you're able to do that, just give your body a bit of a, whatever the bit is that's a bit stiff. Yeah, there we go. That's good. If you have a glass of water, take a drink. Yeah. Stay hydrated. Uh, good, okay. Um, Diana says, it's fine, listening closely, not asleep. Thank you, Diana. That's what I probably needed. I needed feedback. Like everybody else, I miss people being in the room. Uh, okay, taking a deep breath. And then let it go. Taking one more deep breath. Third and last one. Isn't it fantastic breathing with all these people all the way around the world? Okay, I'm going to dive into the next bit of slides. You get all of these, so don't worry, because I know it's a lot of information, but we knew when we were putting it together that people are in such different contexts and such different places that I wanted to give them a set of resources and we'll come back to this in a few weeks so uh 
I'm going to work my way through the next bit without rushing too much if I can. And the next part is really about tools. So just to summarize, we talked about leadership styles. We talked about approaches. We talked about you and how you fit in with teams. We talked briefly, I suppose, in an overview about ways of thinking about projects and what they do. And we gave some examples. Now we're going to kind of get into the, the how. So, and then I'm going to try and make some space at the end of this to see what is in your thinking. So again, you bear with me while I do this bit. Okay, Dominic, online in less than 20 minutes, tell us how to describe or describe how to develop sustainable arts and health programs. So not just arts and health programs, but arts and, arts and health programs that keep going. There's a challenge. Okay. So um, this is, I borrowed this from uh, online. It was a way that somebody was describing how to make a national research project. And they said, um, one, preparatory work. Two, literature review. What have people written? What have people said about this? Three, national focus groups. Four, pilot study. Five, dissemination, digitization, implementation. And that is a perfectly valid way of working. It's sometimes a fantastic way of working, but it reminds me a little bit of what April said about uh, of what I heard from April, which was about the structures that we have for the way that we work. So for me, this is quite a linear process. It's, it's, I can understand, you know, it's like a brick wall. I put in the first brick and then the second brick and the third brick and the fourth brick. Um, but like Kent said, in a creative project, mm, who's in charge? Who's in charge all, I'm in charge some of the time? Who's leading it? Um, is it? Is it that much of a linear project? Well, I think not. I tend to use this. I use this quite a bit. Um, as a, a device, a framework for thinking. What I'm trying to do to make a sustainable project is make a virtuous circle. I'm trying to make something that, that uh, spins and keeps spinning. And the way that I do that is a, as, a, as a creative practitioner, as a, as a creative producer, as a cultural producer, is that I make people curious. I encourage curiosity. I want people to go, what's that? I want them to go, I, that, hmm? I'm just going to turn around and go back and look at that poster or that exhibition. I want people to be engaged. And ideally, if I can, I want people to be inspired. I want them to be, that is fantastic. That's the best, whatever it is I've ever seen. Um, and then what I want to do is I want them to be engaged. I want them to be connected. I want them to feel that they uh, can be part of the thing. They can make a version of it. They can uh, join in painting the mural. They can join a quiet. They can get involved in. It's not something that is for people over there. No. It's, I can go from being curious, being inspired, to being part of somebody's heart and soul. And to do that, then my job is partly to, to skill people up, to give them tools. And then what happens is a little piece of magic. And it's happens with children. If you teach children new things, they want to show it off. If you introduce a new idea into a hospital that works for a hospital, the leads in that hospital want to show it off. They want to share. And what that does is it makes other people curious. So think about the young kids. You know, they learn to play the guitar. Yeah, and then they play off the tune. Here's my tune, it's fantastic. Everybody loves it. And somebody else goes, how do you do that? And so they become little ambassadors for the projects. And so arts and health projects, I think, as well as working because of reports and because of, they also work uh, by propagation. They work in the way that, that honeybees um, and, and plants reseed. They, they spread out and they propagate and they populate. Um, so how do I make people curious? How do I inspire? How do I engage people? How do I skill them up? How do I share? What part of the project, what part of the process am I in? Um, at the very beginning, 
people find this quite difficult. They, I think they, so I use this, this is, um, it's called the ice and sugar bag. It's a way of going from an idea to doing something. And so it's a big, uh, big, big comb. And at the beginning, everything goes in without judgment. There's no such thing as a stupid idea. Why don't we paint our hospital pink with yellow dots? Why don't we start a project in, uh, why don't we start a project run by six-year-olds in a really troubled neighborhood uh, when nothing ever gets written down? Why don't we um, have a project uh, where we're gonna get everybody in the city to walk for 10 minutes every day uh, because we're gonna make a treasure hunt? So everything, doesn't matter, it's not important. All the things you can think about go into the top of the back. And then the next part of the process is thinking about what's most important for you. So uh, is that, what are, we, what are we really trying to do? These are all great ideas, but actually which one's the most important? If I left it alone for a week, what's the one I'd remember next week? The third stage is about how much money do I have and how much time do I have and, and what resources exist in my own community? And that's an incredibly creative stage where you say, I would really like to do a project which has a choir, but I don't have the budget for a choir, but I, there's a school choir, can I work with those? Can I persuade that school choir to come and sing in the hospital on a Tuesday afternoon? Well, that might be difficult, but they have to rehearse on a Thursday. So maybe that's, it's the art of possible. And then the fourth stage is really just making the thing happen. It's kind of very practical. So I include this because I think it's a useful way for going from um, ideas through to what's important, through to what's critical to making it um, continue to work. Okay, I'm just checking the chat. Oops, and now I'm back to my screen. And I'm, I'm gonna have to go out again and then, have I? Okay, one second while I just refigure everything out. Yeah. Um, keep sharing projects in the chat. It's really, it's one of the best things of the fellowship is that you learn from other people. So as you're starting your project, as you're going from what kind of project is it? Is it, is it more about engaging? Is it more about amplification? Is it more about, then you get to the point of going, where do I fit? Um, what can I do? What's my role? What kind of leader am I going to be at what stage of this project? Um, what can't I do? Um, is it a project that's for people or by people? So I include these as they're really useful uh, questions that as you are coming up with all your ideas and then filtering them through, that you, you consult the questions because uh, you're starting to think about your role, the people that you need, the assets that are already in your community, how those assets might be moved to work in a different way, uh, and what might develop. So as I keep saying, this is a process, it's not a fixed, um, it's not a fixed thing. Um, within that process, there are different roles that you will take as an individual, different skills that you will need. Um, and maybe these are some ways of thinking about the process, that the very beginning of the process is really about stopping. It's really about taking that deep breath and sitting back and looking at what makes people healthy or not healthy, looking at who's responsible for health in the context that you work, whether that's a hospital or a community, whether it's an uh, engaged practice, whether you're a painter, whether you are in charge of policy, stop and look and reflect and go talk to people so that you're listening for other voices, you're questioning your own understanding. And then maybe try and develop a little something, a little intervention maybe, the, the paper equivalent of a project and the care. Maybe not the big thing, just the small intervention and then reflect again with people. And that iterative learning, that sense of uh, curiosity, inspiration, connection, skill, share, 
that's starting to make this circle of change uh, work. And as you do that, because this project, this process of, of arts and health is all about taking care, then think about who cares for which part of your project, who cares for the resources, who cares for the people and the partners, who cares for keeping it on time, uh, who cares about the story of the project? How do we know? How do people know about this? How do people that can make decisions for this project to continue know about this? How do we know that we're doing what we wanted to do? Did we set up a way of measuring, of tracking? Uh, do we have a diary? Do we have a do we have a way of measuring the people in the project, whether whether they're benefiting from this at all, or whether what we're doing isn't quite right? So. What is it we want to do? How do we filter through that? How do we start to narrow our focus? Where do I sit? Who do I need to work with? What do I have in my community to play for? And what really helps are all these tools that are really easily available uh, online. And some of you will have used them all the time. Theories of change and SWOT analysis and asset mapping and Gantt charts and risk analysis and budget templates. These are all structural ways for thinking about creative projects. And some people find these really easy. They find it really easy to go from a creative idea into a time chart, into a budget, into looking at teams. Other people find that impossible or close to impossible. Um, and again, it's a way of thinking about what can I bring and what do I need? What help do I need to make this project work? Um, one of the challenges for me of thinking through these tools is that sometimes they can encourage a, a, a sense that we're limited by what we think the assets are in our community. Uh, Connie and I were talking about a presentation he did um, a few months ago, and he said, Dominic said, if I woke up in Nigeria and thought about the projects that I want to do and how much they cost, then we would never get started. We just, I, I would, I just go, it's all too expensive. We'd never get going. But if I thought about the social capital that's available and the people that I can connect with, then we can make amazing transformative things happen. So I want to add in a few um, checks and balances to thinking about projects in a linear way. You kind of have to do this because it's about making a project work and it's the way that project management works. But it's really a important, I think, that you start from a place of abundance. We are the experts in ourselves. We are the experts in our own environment. And anybody that we work with is an expert in being themselves. They are the best person at being them. So we start with already, even if I'm working with a one patient or 10 nurses or a difficult environment, I'm working with people who are expert at being a patient, who are expert in that environment, who are uh, an asset that we can find a way of working with. They contain knowledge and learning. I'm going to skip the Gantt chart because I want to talk about this a little bit. So, so we can think about that process. What is it I want to do? How does it, does it fit in the quadrant? Why did it fit in one of the pockets? Is that a useful way of thinking? Uh, can we put in all the ideas at the beginning? Can we filter them? Can we start to use the, the Gantt charts and the budget? structures but we can also think about them as as um projects that are driven by love and logic and some questions because you wouldn't be here if you weren't uh, sufficiently driven by a love of people to be spending your sunday listening to me talk about how to run a sustainable arts and health program so one of your motivations is a love of people and the logic is really just a way of helping you Think about how that can be beneficial and you can have impact. So if we think about making sustainable arts and health projects through that lens, love and logic and questions, then I'd ask you to think about this. I'd ask you to think, am I okay? Are the people that I work with okay? Are those that we work for okay? And is what we're doing okay? And that might be it. That might be all you need to get started or all you need to keep a project going. And what's key to that is thinking about, well, how do I know? How do I know that I'm okay? How do I know that my project is okay? 
And that's where the tools for thinking, the budgets and the Gantt charts are useful, the timetable or the person that's keeping an eye on whether you're running over time or whether you have the resources. It's why are those, uh, the little heard voices, what did they call them in the thing, the, the, the less heard voices are important because they are the voices that you need to hear to check that what you're doing is effective, is working. And you really need to get someone to check you. We get very carried away with how exciting and extraordinary and fantastic we are. So it's important that within a project, within the cycle of a project, we make some structural moment for that. And it might be, I'm creating a, a compassionate culture network in Ireland at the moment with um, uh, people who are leading, uh, uh, artists, facilitators that are leading uh, sessions where people will explore lost grief um, from the from COVID, where everything has been disrupted. And what's important in that project is that there are a series of, of, of moments in the calendar of the project where everybody gets to have a conversation and be supported to continue to do the work that they are all extraordinarily good at. And if I put that in structurally at the beginning, then hopefully we can change the direction. We can, we can constantly adapt the project. Uh, love lunching and questions the way you're thinking about this is, is what we've talked about before. What am I good at? What am I not good at? Who helps? So am I okay? Am those I work with okay? Are those who work for okay? Is what we are doing okay and how do we know? What am I good at? What am I not good at? Who can help? Do I have skills that are about the skills of my hands, what I've learned, my training? Are they skills of my head or are they skills of my heart? And how do I use each of those in the work that I'm doing? Well, maybe this is all we need to do. We need to get started. We need to make a version of something, of an arts and health project. And then we need to make a better version. And that process of iteration uh, is what I'd encourage you to think about as you start to think about the projects that you maybe already are doing and would like to do in the future. That sometimes what we do is good enough. It may not be perfect, but it's good enough with the assets that I've got, the time that I've got, the connections that I've got, the place that I'm in. It's good enough, but I'd like to make a better version. And I think that continuous sense uh, to improve and do better is what brings us here on a Sunday. So in the rest of this, when you get it, you'll see that there are links to different things I've referred to, to references, resources, websites, uh, people that I, that I reference in the project. But the biggest resource is really yourselves. You are... Uh, an 80 or 90 person library of amazing information uh, from all sorts of contexts and all sorts of environments. And I really encourage you to reach out to each other, to put projects in the chat, to, uh, to learn from each other, to set yourselves up as a peer network where your checks and balances are each other and your less heard voices are the voices of the people in this group. Okay, I'm gonna read the chat. I'm going to see if there's, there's questions I can answer. If you've got questions, put your hand up and we'll maybe spend the next 20 minutes-ish uh, responding to what has come up for you, what you're thinking about. How can, I, uh, how can I work to support you and your projects? How can you support each other? Okay, so uh, I'm going to mute for a second while I look at the chat. Bear with
Great. Okay. So what I really like in the chat is that you're already sharing information. Um, so if you want to add in uh, more things, please do. Um, I'm not going to because you're going to get a pile of resources from that. Um, but yeah, if there are there are questions or thoughts or observations or something that's just a bit annoying, like that thing that Dominic said, I just don't agree with that. Or that doesn't work where I'm based. Or that just sounds like, no. Nah. Please bring it into our virtual room. Okay, so Eki's talking about sustaining. Or asking about sustaining. Eki, you got some thoughts on that you'd like to kind of share, maybe? You want to speak? So, Jonathan, can you unmute Eki? Uh, Eki, put up your hand. It's easier for them to, to find you. Yeah, yeah, cool. Um, I can't see myself. Oh, there I am. Okay. So, um, I was thinking because, um, first of all, I really appreciated um, the other sort of looking at um, the project process from a completely different point of view than I would have looked at before. So, I'm always looking at, you know, the project idea, then you do a little bit of research, engaging the people that you're going to work with, etc. implementation, feedback, evaluation. And um, I think by looking at the um, diagram that you showed before where it had the inspire, engage, skill up, share, make curious, that really opened my eyes a bit because it suddenly made me realize that um, I tend to think of a project, you know, from the very beginning, implementation, monitoring it, then start again. But just through this, now I've realized that where you've got the make curious, the make curious could be number one and the end. So then it does keep going around. And that's where my, my question, I've suddenly just added continuity to the end of my normal first list. But I'm wondering if you've got any sort of um, of thoughts around how you make your project, you know, sustainable as it continues. Are there any changes? Well, obviously, you'd have to sort of look at your evaluation and see what worked and what didn't work. But you know, um, as you've spoken from project idea to you know to keep it moving, I would think that somewhere around there. There should be something around sustainability. I don't know if I if I'm clear. Yep, no, it's great. I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna ask another two or three people to kind of add in on this and see if we can build answers between us. Uh, so Ria, you, you in the chat, Ria, you talk about the MSC method. Uh, X, would you be kind enough to explain a little bit for people that are not familiar? And let's see if I can start to weave some connections between you and uh, some ways of thinking. Thank you. Hi, um, I can make an example with a project that I did with the First Nation community in Kimberley. Um, one of the things that we did is we did workshops with young artists on relief printing methods. And then we began by showing them how to do it on lino and then wood and then metal. Right. Um, and the aim was to basically create intergenerational transfer of knowledge, because a lot of the First Nation knowledge that we have in South Africa is being lost because there's no communication between old people and young people um, in these communities. So some of the beautiful rock art um, work that we have in South Africa, the techniques are getting lost um, because there's no communication between those two groups. Um, so. With the Bloodfontein print project, our first step was to basically have this dialogue of conversation with the community and say, what is actually like the biggest problem that you guys face? And that was what they brought up. They're afraid that they're losing their heritage because nobody's interested in learning from them. So this project became a gateway in order to um, 
sustainably basically create a process where that happens. So every year the community has to have like a dialogue of conversation and they have to use whatever they learn from the elders to create artworks. They use the relief printing process and then they try and sell those artworks in order to make more money so that they have materials for the next year's course of events. So at this stage, Freestyle Arts and Health doesn't even have to be involved anymore. We can literally step back because continuously they are um, re getting new stories and it goes on and on and on and on. Um, and what we mean by the most significant change method is based, MSC method is the most significant change method. So what is the most significant change in this example? The most significant change is there was no intergenerational transfer of knowledge, but the significant change is now that there is. So the MSC method um, in, in, in the way we use it is continuously going back to the community and saying, hi, we've done this so far, how has it changed your life? has it reached the outcome that you were expecting? And then that becomes our monitoring and evaluation process. Instead of actually saying that the process and the outcome is that we have to have prints. So the prints aren't the end results or the change we're actually looking for. It is a process or a means by which we're trying to create that change. I don't know if I'm making sense. Fabulous, you make complete yes. sense. And it's a fantastic example. Thank you so much for bringing it into the room. I'm going to add on to that uh, by April, if you would be kind enough. I wonder how you would think about this question of, of sustainability. Um, just wonder what you might be thinking at the moment that you might bring in, if you would be kind enough. I can't see you on my thing. Oops. Uh, or anybody else? Okay, just any anything that people people might be thinking that they want to add to this. Uh, so the reason for asking April was April had talked before about community and structure and um, different conceptual models. I suppose. Not really starting from community, starting from um, uh, maybe recognizing and acknowledging that not everybody's communication tools or that people have access to are the same. Uh, starting from maybe what many people in the health service think of as a, a starting from April, hi, you're there. Can you, I wonder what you'd add to this. I'm, I'm curious as to what you might think would be interesting to contribute. Can you, can you, is that okay? Oops. Hello, can you hear me? Perfectly, yeah. Okay. Um, I think when it comes to community, they're going back to the levels of the bottom up. And I guess the, the bottom up for me is what I meant by how we process information. And that um, a lot of the things we experience goes through our sensory complex first and then forms these memories. And so if communities and people are holding um, collective memories, how do we create space to externalize those memories and make the communication, use the, using the artwork to make the communication more objective, to give distance between um, people and their shared experiences, and then using that as a um, springing board to discuss similarities and differences to really hone in or experience that cliche um, principle of we're all more alike than we are different. Because sometimes it's very hard to know that to be true through simply, you know, verbal like language and the miscommunication that happens and just the way trauma impacts people completely, you know, different. Um, and so I think serving that as a foundation will be a starting point to integrate to what um, the individual before was talking about. Mm -hmm. And April, I wonder whether, is there a project that comes to mind when you talk about that? Um, so I believe in mobility. And so um, 
I always think of like some type of transportation, like a bus um, that could be very visible where everybody could see and participate in. But then that bus goes into these different communities or different areas. And um, there's a tracking progress of what communities have done um, from session to session to kind of start connecting the dots or start connecting those experiences. Um, I believe accessibility and mobility. So I, I'm a project that I'm currently bringing forth now is a is a, a mental health um, arts arts bus that reaches communities. Fantastic, great. Um, let's see if we can kind of add together and whether I'm answering Aki's question really about sustainability. So I, th I think, so, so if, I, if I pull some ideas out of what Ria was talking about. So the, the sustainability is, is achieved by the most significant change and the most significant change in the example that she gave is about making connections between generations of people. Um, and in April's example, it's about creating uh, a most significant uh, intervention by, by uh, instead of asking people to come to a project that benefit is maybe a benefit is taking the project to them, is thinking about transportation, thinking about access, where are literally physical space. And you can put both of those together and think about the sustainability piece in all sorts of different ways. Um, uh, so, let me think. so, so, if I work in the UK, uh, there are there are there are relative to some places I work in lots of resources. There is also a, a system of support and funding that's evolving that wants to measure the success of those projects. Um, and evaluate it within a particular framework. And that's quite a narrow time band, because if I sit outside of it and think about what is impacting the communities that makes them unhealthy, there's much bigger issues. So sometimes with the work that I do with older people uh, or in uh, communities that are sick because they are um, uh, displaced or dislocated or they have no memory, then uh, that's a really, it's a 400, 500 year old issue that has created these current problems that we are facing and repeatedly face. And no fantastic hospital or amazing kit is going to really sort that out. What is going to sort that out is other tools and other ways. And some of those tools are about uh, being, being seen, uh, having control in your environment, be, have, being heard, being recognized, and gluing together the ends of the Industrial Revolution, for instance. Uh, however, if I talk like that, when I talk to the head of an NHS trust, they're going to look at me like I have nine heads. Yeah, I'm going to have a conversation with someone who's talking to this person who's sat on my shoulder. Yeah, yeah there's lots of nodding going on, yeah? So uh, as a project manager or developer, I have to learn translation skills, or I have to work with people, because I'm not great on that, who are fantastic at the translation skills, who can... Uh, take the work that I'm doing and uh, articulate it or evaluate it in Likert scales, in uh, health indicators, in uh, da, 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 da. yeah, whatever those tools are. And as a project manager though, what I'm doing is sitting back and thinking about what do we achieve? What's the most significant impact or what's, what's working? However, I want to articulate that within this project and how is this project fitting within a much bigger time frame, And is that working within this idea of trying to make this momentum for health happen? Yeah. So uh, that, that sense of, of measuring and evaluation is incredibly important in some contexts. In some contexts, it, I, I work with artists who work in war zones. <laughs> like, uh, you know, what, what's a sign of success? I'm still alive tomorrow. I work in artists who think about uh, art that's made uh, relative to, yeah, war, okay? And so they think about it in terms of is, uh, when, when the bomb is landed on someone's head, no art is made. 
but a day later or in the next village art is made quite often to do with connection and then as you go along the time frame or as you go along the distance different type of art gets to be made as a different function and so they're one of the ways they think about evaluating is through uh through that framework um uh, sustainability yeah sustainability ultimately is all about people everything i think we do is about people it's just about the people in the room and the sustainability is the resilience and adaptability of the people in the room to respond to the challenges that they see that are important today or tomorrow or um or about our ability to support and encourage and sustain each other which is why i think these groups are so incredibly important and it's so exciting sitting with people who work in the us or in south africa or in cairo or because your contexts are not the same what will make health in your environment is not necessarily the same the way that people came to be in the places that you're in are really not the same and yet some things are biology is kind of you know heartbeat and lungs and fresh air kind of works fresh water kind of works but everything else is is different and so uh and and yet there are assets in every single community from which you can build wondrous wondrous transformative projects uh, even the fact that on this call of 80 people uh there are people where it's easy to kind of bring things forth there are other people for whom that is just not the way that things work um just that fact changes the kind of way that you might think about what an intervention is or how successful it is or how you might evaluate it and sustain it but what's key i think to all of them is it's fundamentally about the people in the room it's fundamentally about the things i've been talked about creating a place in which exchange can happen with whatever heart and hands and head skills that people bring and recognizing that not all tools are the same some tools work in different contexts you know in a formal healthcare system we would present maybe and articulate and evaluate in a different way than we would in a i don't know a project in delhi uh, with 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 dalit on train stations so very different kind of um ways of talking about and presenting and sustaining and also finally uh some of you will work with organizations i suspect some of you i know very little about you but some of you will work with organizations some of you will work as individuals some of you will come to this as artists some of you will come to this with i can see doctors i can see people with phds some working with academics you've got these incredible bags of knowledges incredible bags of knowledge uh, but they're very different and you have the the, the knowledge that you've learned in context and to learn from each other uh, is i think why arts and health is so incredibly important as we build health and care systems everywhere around the globe that work for as many people as it's possible to do that for um okay there are three minutes um i am kind of done talking really believe it or not thank you so much for listening to me talk on and on and on and on it's a lot of talk i try not to talk this much normally but um if there is feedback feed it back feed it back through the arts and medicine fellowship they will send out to you the 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 pdf powerpoint they'll make it accessible to you do 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 go through all the links and uh the next session i think is, is two weeks time so maybe i can do that session in lots of different ways so i'll prepare something but if you have things that you bring from this to that section i'll make time i think to start that session off i'm always fascinated by you know i have a plan and then there's people and then it goes where it goes so um if we can use that next session a little bit like this to all those people that didn't get to talk today i uh, love you all you're very welcome and i'm crazy interested in uh, what i haven't yet heard thank you thank you so much Dominic, for that really insightful session
Um, I just have one request. Could you please type your email address in the chat box for some of us that still have full of questions? John, say again, you won't mind? Your email address for those that still have follow up questions. All right. So we'll be taking a picture now, as usual. So, can everyone please turn on their cameras? Yeah, we're taking a picture now. John, do you want me to moderate that <laughs> so that we are not all on Zoom, right? Because I guess everybody is just looking, what do you want us to do? <laughs> all right, so I'm going to do a quick one um, with all these lovely faces. Uh, yeah, thanks so much. So let's go. Uh, okay, please put on your camera. Thank you so much, Anna. And please smile. <laughs> and you can pose whichever way. All right. All right. I think I got the first screen and then I'll go to the second one. I, I'm seeing Dr. Femi, uh, Feliz. Uh, yeah. Uh, KZ, I'm seeing you. Please put on your camera. Uh, Dr. Geraldine, your camera, please. Victor, Chiwendo. Dr. Dahlia, yeah. Thank you so much. Thanks so much, Diane. Oh, amazing. Ah, uh ah. -uh. Good, awesome. Okay, I think we're done. Um, yeah. Okay, I think we're done. Uh, let me let me, on behalf of the, of the Arctic Medicine Fellowship team and also uh, the fellows to say a big thank you to Dominic today. This is such an enriching experience, and uh, we didn't even know it's, it's up to two hours already, and we just keep going and going and going. There's so much to to share and. Um, Amazingly also to be able to see what uh, the incredible project that our fellows are already doing, like Rhea in South Africa, like Kame in the UK. I mean, this is like um, an eye opener in a way to be able to dive in into what the fellows are already doing and how that connects even to today's class. So uh, some of you are already providing leadership, uh, like Dominic has taught today. And I want to believe very strongly that this class has been uh, a great uh, experience for you and has made an impact and um, also in a way added to the existing knowledge that you have in a way even though you have knowledge in the area of leadership probably some of the things he has shared today are uh, just like um, Eki mentioned uh, you know in some of the things the step by step to doing certain things and that will be a plus so a big thank to all of you today and to the amazing and comfort today, Teresia, and also John. Thanks so much for such a great, 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 and incredible job. So please, uh, let's use our emojis to appreciate Dominic and to appreciate Teresia, to also appreciate um, um, John for such a great session today. Thank you so, so much. And Dominic is going to be joining us again for the second session and uh, like what he has mentioned today. So if you have more questions, please just put your questions together, put them, you can forward it to the admin, probably the admin can send it to him rather than about over 100 people ask, sending him email. I think that will be overwhelming. <laughs> so if you do have questions, please kindly forward it to the admin. Let the admin actually collect and collate the question and send it as a single document. I suppose like 100 people sending Dominic, it won't be able to attend to you. So I think there's wisdom in that, all right? Thanks so much, everyone. Over to you, John and Teresia, please. Thank you very much for that addition. Um, I will be dropping a, a form in the chat box. So this is the monitoring and evaluation form. So everyone should do well to fill that out as soon as possible. Yes. So Teresa, do you have any addition while I 